of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals. We um, have a quorum tonight with one uh, missing member. Uh, Michael Tranfaglia is not here yet. Hopefully he will show up in the next few minutes. Um, the board is still sitting one board member short of our full board complement of seven members after the resignation um, last week of Mr. Last month, rather, of Mr. Brustowski, there has not yet been um, a new member appointed, to my knowledge, uh, to take his place. The first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes of September 25, 2001. Now, none of the board members received the minutes until this evening, so I haven't reviewed them, and I'm sure that none of the other board members have reviewed them. So I suggest um, that we defer the approval of the minutes of the September 25, 2001 meeting until our next regularly scheduled meeting in order to give the board opportunity to review and comment on the minutes. Um, can I have a motion to that effect? Uh, motion by Mr. Keneally, um, second by Ms. Miller to uh, defer the consideration of the September 25, 2001 minutes until the next regularly scheduled meeting of the board. Discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Opposed? The motion is approved by a vote of five in favor, zero opposed. And we will consider the minutes at our next regularly scheduled meeting. Uh, next item on the agenda is old business, and we have two items of old business. The first is to um, continue hearing the evidence of the appeal of Joseph A. Fristasi, 8 Rosewood Drive, tax map U34, lot 22-4, for rear and side property line variances of 5 feet from the required 20 feet for lots within the proposed 19-lot Blueberry Ridge subdivision. Um, where we left off last month, the applicant, Mr. Frischassi, um, personally and through his counsel, presented evidence to us at the conclusion of which um, Mr. Crawford, through um, on behalf of various neighboring property owners, presented evidence in opposition to the application. And Mr. Crawford had just finished his presentation and summary, and we had turned to Mr. Haddoff for his response and at that point, we adjourned for the evening. Um, and we can turn to you now, Mr. Haddo, for any response that you would like to make. But actually, before we do that, I'm sorry. Before we do that, um, one of the things we took up at the conclusion of last month's hearing was a site visit by members of the board. And I had sent a letter out to uh, counsel for the parties giving them an opportunity to voice any objection to the individual board members making a site visit, and there were no objections. Um, I don't know um, how many of the members of the board actually did conduct a site visit, but to the extent that anyone did, uh, it is appropriate um, at this point for each of the board members to state whether they in fact conducted a visit, um, when they did, what they did during that visit, uh, what they saw, if they spoke to any of the parties um, in order to give um, any of the parties an opportunity to respond to um, any evidence that might be taken under consideration by the board members as a result of that site visit. Um, so I, in fact, made a visit. So perhaps I should just go first in describing uh, 
uh, my visit. And I did a site walk on Saturday, October 20th, uh, mid-afternoon. And I simply walked the uh, uh, boundary of Mr. Fristasi's property um, to see the abutting, abutting properties along Edgewood, uh, Charlotte, and Gowdy. Um, I did speak personally with two of the abutting property owners who were in their backyards while I was walking the perimeter of uh, Mr. Fristasi's property. Um, I spoke with Mr. Peterson um, and Ms. Uh, Donini, uh, both of whom showed me uh, their rear property lines. Um, they showed me, um, uh, Mr. Peterson showed me a stake, a couple of stakes that were in the ground, uh, denoting what he believed to be his rear property line. Uh, Ms. Danini simply showed me a fence post that she believed marked um, her rear property line. Um, and that was, that was the extent of my conversations with them. Um, I did see signs that somebody had posted in a couple of places um, showing what purported to be the 15 foot, 20 foot, and 50 foot um, setbacks from the adjoining uh, uh, boundary line. Um, I think those signs were posted, one of those, one set of those signs was posted at the end of Charlotte Road, um, and another one was near the uh, Peterson residence. Um, I also walked the uh, line of stakes that marked the center line of the proposed uh, Blueberry Road, at least I assume that that's what those stakes marked. I think Mr. Fristasi at the end of last month's hearing told us what those stakes were, and I did walk that line of stakes just to see where the center line of Blueberry Road was. And that was the extent of my site visit, and I did that visit alone. Well, I had two kids with me for part of it. They did not take part in any discussion. <laughs> um, Mr. Tranfaglia has joined us. Um, would you like to uh, tell us whether you, in fact, made a site visit, and if so, uh, when, and what you did or saw during that? Yes, I went on this past Sunday, the 20th. 20th, I believe, and about 4 o'clock in the afternoon by myself. And I <clears throat> entered the property of Mitchell Road where the previous structure was and basically walked back to a big boulder, uh, tripped over a few logs, saw nobody, and uh, returned home. I had no discussions about my visit. And total time on the site was approximately 15 minutes. Ms. Miller? I went today to the property. I um, it was about two o'clock this afternoon. I um, drove down Mitchell, um, pulled over. I didn't get out of the car at Mitchell, um, and just did a, a an inspection from the car, and then um, went up Cottage and Shore, and um, drove down. Um, I think I went down. Um, I can't remember which way. I thought I entered on Edgewood but came up the road, went to the very end of the dead end, came back, went up Charlotte, um, down to Edgewood, and got out of the car at the end of Charlotte and walked around saw the signs marked, and um, then went back again and looked at how the, the rear, um, how the houses would be defected from the rear, and did not talk to anybody. Mr. Keneally. No, I, I did not visit either. Scheduled it for today, but after receiving this letter that was submitted by Mr. Fustashi dated October 12th, withdrawing his request for variances um, on the rear of these abutting lots, to me the point became moot. I should have. Uh, Mr. LaPlante. <clears throat> I visited the site on uh, October 22nd between 4:15 and 4:45, parked on Gowdy Street and. Um, went in between the houses of 74 and 70 and essentially walked up the line and then back down to sh the uh, dead end of Charlotte, um, walking the property lines and uh, viewed the same signs that you had mentioned. And while there, did not speak to anyone. Dr. Chapman. I, uh, attended the property on two occasions. Uh, the first was about two weeks ago uh, in my automobile and, and uh, viewed all accesses from all roads and, and all 
directions. Uh, attended a second time today, uh, uh, late in the afternoon, about five, I believe, and walked the perimeter of the entire property. Uh, uh, entered off of Mitchell Road, the lot off of Mitchell Road. And uh, I also viewed the two sets of signs and that were on the two boundaries, property lines. Okay, thank you. Do either council have questions for any of the board members about any more details about the site visits? I didn't witness any signage. I saw some stakes. Some were orange and some were black and white striped. Okay. Um, Mr. Hedo, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, actually, my contribution uh, this evening will be quite brief. Um, as I'm sure you all realize at this point, Mr. Fristacci, following uh, the meeting last month, took a hard look at uh, his plans and made the decision to withdraw his request for the rear line setback variances. Uh, that was a twofold uh, consideration. One was that uh, it became clear to him that most of the opposition to uh, the variance request was based on concerns about that rear line setback variance. The other issue was that uh, there is a 20-foot drainage easement running along the back of those proposed lots uh, 13 through 19 all the way along the Gowdy Street side, and he really didn't want to infringe at all on that 20-foot drainage easement. So as it stands right now, um, the request is, there, there are no requests for rear line setbacks anywhere along the Gowdy Road, uh, sorry, Gowdy Street, Gowdy, sorry, the Gowdy side in any event, nor uh, uh, is there any request for uh, a uh, setback variance on lot 13 where it abuts the fog property, uh, except as the, the road uh, setback may apply to that. Uh, nor on lot 11 where it abuts the Sawyer property again, except to the extent that, that may have some, some well, the, 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 the 75 foot road setback shouldn't be an issue there anyway. So, all of those property lines 11, 13 uh, where it abuts uh, the Fog property and, and, and on Gowdy Street and all the rest of the way down Gowdy Street, there are no longer any requests for setback variances on those sides of the proposed lots. Um, lot, the request for a setback on lot, uh, variance on lot 12 remains as it was, which is to say a 25 foot setback instead of the, what would be a 50 foot setback from the property line, 75 foot setback from the road. So um, I know that Mr. Fristacci has some specific information that he wants to address to the board uh, on the issue of practical difficulty. So I'll yield the floor to him at this point. Thank you. Very good, thank you. My name is Joe Fustacci. I'm the applicant, and I live at 8 Rosewood Drive. I think at the last meeting, David, you asked for rebuttal to what uh, Mr. Crawford stated in his arguments. He made reference to two, uh, two points that I think need to be clarified, or at least corrected. Firstly, uh, he mentioned that the open space zoning was dedicated to low or moderate income housing. That's absolutely erroneous. And if you read the zoning ordinance, you'll see that it's to afford uh, to uh, 
provide affordable opportunities for people to purchase homes in Cape Elizabeth. Secondly, he indicated that I admitted that I could build houses on these lots. Well, that's correct. You can build a house on a building envelope of approximately, well, in this particular case, the largest one being 50 feet wide by 40 feet deep. Absolutely. You can build yourself a ranch. You can build yourself a colonial. But you can't build the type of house that people in Cape Elizabeth want. And this is what the ordinance is supposed to be addressing. The intent of the ordinance is to address the desires of the people living in Cape Elizabeth, to have an opportunity to purchase a lot and build a house with the requirements that they, that they need. And that also it may be the same size that's on the house, or the, excuse me, the lot that abuts their property. So there's two points that I want to make. One is the feasible alternative. There is no feasible alternative to what I'm requesting. As Mr. Haddow pointed out, I've dropped my request for the rear setback on these lots because one of the concerns that the abutters have is drainage. Mr. Manthorn, the engineer in this project, has designed an elaborate drainage system that requires the 20-foot setback. This is an evolving subdivision plan, and this was discussed with the town engineer, with the um, public works director, after the last meeting. So with that requirement for the subdivision, we dropped that rear, rear request for the 20-foot setback. And that just maximizes or increases the, the need to expand these lots so we can build something that's comparable to what's in the neighborhood. Highlighted in the pink are properties that surround this subdivision. And every one of these in pink has a bigger footprint than what is allowed in this subdivision based on the current standards in the open zoning um, ordinance. I point out 100 Gowdy Street, 75 feet wide, 96, 62, 52, 53. This one is 48 by 54, quite a large, quite a large lot, uh, large, large building. 54 feet, 52 feet, 62 feet. This one, it's hard to tell without getting out and measuring it, but the buildings themselves are 95 feet. And the one at 142 Mitchell Road is 96 feet wide. The zoning ordinance, or the intention of this, the zoning ordinance, is to reduce the lot sizes to set aside land for open space. And in reducing the lot sizes down, it, there is a provision there to reduce the setbacks. You can reduce them down to five feet on either side. I'm asking for you to reduce them five feet so that it's 15 feet on either side. Practical difficulty, we cannot match what surrounds us. You have from the assessor's office in Cape Elizabeth and in South Portland documentation showing what is built on the houses that surround the subdivision. These are not my my measurements, these are the measurements in the assessor's office of Cape Elizabeth and South Portland. Second fact, when we do a subdivision, I say we developers, it costs us money. Whether you buy the property today, last week, 10 years ago, or whatever. The infrastructure cost, development cost, determine what the lot cost will be. Lot costs in this subdivision are going to be somewhere between $75,000 and $85,000 each. Based on those numbers, someone paying that kind of money wants a house with a deck, two-car garage, some amenities that would make the house 
comparable to the homes in the neighborhood. I think you can find records of property selling $200,000 plus in this neighborhood. Based on the cost of the land, I cannot build a house that would fit on this building envelope. And that is why I'm here now to ask for a request to expand the building envelope 10 feet, five feet on either side. That would give you 15 foot side setbacks, a total of 30 feet between the houses. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hedo, anything additional? Just a, a quick question, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Are we at this point, is the board at this point considering both of the variance requests, or are we limited at this point to the first variance request that excludes lot 12? Only the first one excluding lot 12. All right, thank you. We'll take lot 12 up separately. Mr. Crawford? Good evening, it's one month later, um, we're back again. I guess uh, when we started our discussion some month ago, that was a little bit different project, but I'd, I'd like to just highlight on that. We, the neighbors appreciate the withdrawal of the rear setback request, but it still doesn't quite address uh, the issues completely in regards to this variance request. I'd like to clarify that my clients don't object to principal adjustments in the side uh, yard variance, you know, or side yards distances. Um, as those distances relate to the interior of the proposed subdivision. I mean, our concern, folks, is encroachment on the properties on the outside of the development. So if what Mr. Fristacci is proposing is, you know, to compress the development of the structures within the subdivision in terms of the side to side, we don't take objection to that as long as those are principal adjustments and, and you folks can uh, meter that as well as the planning board. <coughs> We do, uh, however, believe that the 50-foot setback that's set out in the ordinance under section 19.7-2C6 is the proper setback requirement for this type of development. That's in the uh, open space provisions. And if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense that it's there. It allows some accommodation, you're allowed to put greater density of development in this type of development. And the idea is, if we're gonna do that, we need to have some accommodation and some recognition that there are other structures, that there are other neighborhoods, and that there are other houses around there that we maybe ought to have some distance to. Because we're compressing here and we're making accommodations for open space for these structures, but those structures that are on the outside that are already existing don't necessarily directly benefit. So I think it's part of the give and take in the ordinance, and, and we would suggest that that standard is the one that that's, uh, must be complied with. 50 feet from building envelope to existing building envelope. And to veer from the standard, um, as you folks know, you have to satisfy those two immediate variance criteria. The first is you have to make a determination that the granting of the variance will not result in a substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance. Now, I know Mr. Prestacci's got his view on what the intent of the ordinance is, but I think if you peel it back one layer further, what you'll find is that this is a proposal for one type of development. And the second part is that we have to talk about this practical difficulty test. But there are other options that are clearly here under the ordinance. And I think you folks have to weigh that and say, has he proven that this is his only option before you decide to grant a variance? <clears throat> Let's talk for a moment about the practical difficulty. Thanks. Well, be before you even get into that part of the argument. Certainly, Mr. Back. Um, I've tried to give some thought to how the 50 feet setback or the, the 50 feet building envelope requirement ties into the rear setback requirements. Right. 
Um, and we're probably going to want some input from our council on this. I'm glad to see he's here. But it seems to me that the placement of the building envelope is not a zoning board function, that that is a function solely of the planning board. The zoning board has the ability to grant a variance. And as I read the ordinance, a variance can be granted for setbacks. The placement of the building envelope is not a setback. The side and rear setbacks are set here by our ordinance at 20 feet. A request by Mr. Fristacci for us to deviate from the side setback requires a variance under the practical difficulty standard. We can vote that up or down, but it seems to me that from here he's going to have to go to planning, to the planning board, for them to set the building envelope. The, build, the term building envelope doesn't seem to be defined anywhere in the ordinance. But by custom and practice, at least in Cape Elizabeth, building envelope has always been a planning board function. But it's defined, is it not, by the side, front, and rear setbacks? I'm not sure it is. There's certainly some overlap. But even though we set a rear setback of 20 feet, the planning board, it seems to me, can still set the building envelope at 50 feet back if they feel it appropriate to do so for any number of reasons, whether it's because the ordinance requires that they do that or whether it's because there might be wetlands that need to be respected or for any other reason. But I would appreciate, and I'm sure the other members of the board would also appreciate hearing from um, our council, um, if Mr. Parkinson could favor us with any input on that, we'd appreciate it. And Mr. Parkinson, if you wouldn't mind stepping up. Sorry. I'm all ears. And Mr. Crawford, I don't mean to no, no, that's okay. have you step aside. We'll give you an opportunity to come back up. Okay. I'm um, Derwood Parkinson. I'm an attorney in Kennebunk, so uh, the good thing about that is that I don't have a lot of contact with you folks, but hopefully I bring a, a fairly unbiased point of view to this. Um, I've been asked to fill in for this uh, particular project. A large part of my practice is in the municipal law area, representing some towns in York County like York and Wells and others. So. Um, what I have learned from that is that each town is slightly different. The requirements are slightly different. Um, obviously, the, the thing that you have to grapple with here is uh, your ordinance and, and attempting to uh, do your best to understand what the wording of that ordinance is. One of the things uh, that's uh, complicating matters here is some recent case law that's come out, um, namely this uh, Perkins versus a gun quit case which has sort of clouded some of the issues here about what the planning board is supposed to do in terms of its jurisdiction and ability to grant waivers and, or, uh, waivers and what, the, uh, what may be, in reality, new responsibilities for the zoning board fields. That's just general background. I, I think the chairman asked me a specific question, so I'll, I'll try to get directly to that question. The question, and I understand the issue on, on, on the table here is, whether um, the planning or this board uh, needs to be concerned about the requirement. No, I'm going to get my ordinance back here. Of a 50 foot um, of the requirement under section 19.7 C6 that, that there be at least 50 uh, feet between any uh, building envelope from adjacent lots. And it, if I understand what Mr. Crawford is suggesting is that there are building envelopes uh, that have been established on these adjacent lots in, in South Portland. Correct. Uh, what the chairman was asking was, uh, is it within the jurisdiction of the zoning board to be dealing with this issue to begin with? Isn't the question of uh, placement of uh, building setbacks, something the planning board does. Um, the Perkins uh, decision, uh, I believe, 
transfer of some of the responsibility for granting the waiver, or, or some and perhaps all the responsibility of granting waivers under that section to the zoning board. Now that may not be something that you want to be involved with, but I think that that's the, the impact of that, of, of making those decisions. I think it sort of ties the hands of the uh, planning board and gives you the jurisdiction over those issues. Uh, the, f the first thought that I had about uh, that issue is um, the difficulty that arises for this board to be interpreting, in essence, uh, the setback or uh, building envelope regulations of another town. And, and um, I think that that's problematic because each town has its own planning process. Each town has its own comprehensive plan. Each town has its own reasons for why it puts setback regulations in place. It's sort of a, um, a, a mosaic that's weaved. Sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't make sense, but each town goes through that process. Um, I think it's difficult to read into that language uh, a requirement that you take in consideration the setback in a neighboring town and how that was established. For example, what if they established a um, building envelope that was one foot from the property line? Would that require you to respect a full 50 feet? Uh, I think that, that that's difficult for you to do and would advise you against that. Um, and, and I think uh, to the extent that the applicant and the abutters can have some guidance on that point at this board's level, and perhaps you don't need to uh, address that because that's not actually what they're asking for is a variance on that point, but I, I believe that um, at, le at least giving them some advice would, would be helpful how you feel about that, whether you agree with that, um, that proposition that I've expressed. You're advising us that we need not respect the building lots established in South Portland? Yes, I am. And, and is that because of the uh, manner and, and timing in which they were created? I don't know or specifically just about regardless the of when. And timing, but I, my primary issue with it is that it is the, in essence, the um, the work of another town, and uh, and a process that uh, is a result of another town zoning ordinance, comprehensive plan, planning board regulations, and things that frankly that you don't know, and at least unless you've lived there and sat on the board and been deeply involved, wouldn't know a lot about. So I think that that's a a, a problematic um, a direction for you folks to, to go into and advise against it. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Mr. Parkinson. Oh, sure. Your authority for that is the Perkins decision, or is that just your understanding? No, the Perkins decision um, uh, doesn't speak directly to that okay, point. I think so. Um, what the Perkins decision is, is saying, in, in, a, in boiling this down, is that there's certain things that we took for granted that a planning board could, could do by way of waiver. Um, um, certain things. Uh, that went beyond the waiver of, say, something simple like uh, landscaping plans or, 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 or aesthetic considerations that got into uh, dimensional things. And the Perkins case is saying, planning board, you can't do those, do that anymore. That this, the legislative scheme set up in Title 30A, the legislative sch scheme that set up the authority for the Zoning Board of Appeals, grants them that authority to grant those things. And so. What it is doing, and, and it's a little unclear where it all ends up, and there's probably going to be more cases that will come down the pike that will clarify this, is, is shifting um, the waiver of authority, waiver authority from the planning board over the zoning board. And, and this is an interesting situation where um, the planning board pre-Perkins had quite a bit of discretion to, to grant um, waivers uh, in these areas as it saw fit to to accommodate what they, they consider to be good planning. Uh, unfortunately, I think that because of the Perkins decision, the planning board's ability to do that is limited now. And I was talking to Bruce before the meeting. It's, it's something that this town and every town's got to take a look at going forward in terms of how it might adjust its, its codes uh, in light of the, the Perkins decision. Unfortunately, the law court didn't give us a lot of um, guidance in terms of what a town should do. And, but I guess we're going to have to look with that. Okay, so your, your reasoning that we don't have to take into account the South Portland envelopes is based on what authority? 
it's, it's not based on a, a specific case. Um, it, it's based on um, the notion that when the ordinance talks about building envelopes, um, it's talking about building envelopes established under the, the town's ordinance. Um, and, and I'm aware, and, 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 and we're very respectful of the, um, the argument that's being made, and, and certainly being made in good faith, that there could be reasons and, and arguments based on planning and aesthetics why it should apply to neighbor, neighboring um, building setbacks. And I'm not discounting that argument as, as being frivolous, but I, I think it's um, a road that you probably don't want to go down to when you start taking in consideration other um, town's ordinances. Is there any case law that bears on this? I'm not aware of any, and I do my best to keep up with all the, um, the cases. Uh, the, the body of law and zoning is, is really been developed in the last 20 years and, it, and it's only, and, and we are a small state population wise and so there really are a, a limited number of cases that, that are irrelevant. So I'm sort of um, basing my opinion based on what I, I, would, I would say um, the court has said in other cases and it would say in general stick with your ordinance and, and, and try to grasp what the ordinance um, meant when at the time it was adopted. But no, I don't think you're going to find anything directly on point. I'd be very surprised if you did. I mean, this is this is so, a somewhat unique situation, having a subdivision that straddles, uh, or doesn't straddle, but ju just laid out the way this one is. Anybody else? I don't want to. Cut yeah, it didn't anything. strike me that it necessarily had to be that unique. That's why mm -hmm. I was wondering. Well, yeah, may, well, maybe it isn't that unique. You know that, uh, and, and, and often, often you, I've seen numerous subdivisions that go over the property line and you're doing the review in two, two, um, two jurisdictions and, and you get into this whole thing where the, um, the actually what some towns will say is if it straddles it, the, the other side is an overlay district in, in the uh, other town and, the, and that the laws do apply. So well, there are things that I'm sure that the, the planner and, and, and the people that specialize in that sort of ordinance drafting could, could suggest to, you know, to, by way of uh, adjusting your ordinance. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Parkinson. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> uh, Mr. Crawford. And I realize it's awkward to come up and sit down, but bear with us since we only have one podium. I spent a little time at the legislature. It's not uh, that unusual. Um, if I might, I'd just like to perhaps uh, raise a point uh, respectfully perhaps disagreeing with the interpretation provided by Council for the Town. I suggest that the uh, board may want to look at the purpose statement for the general standards that apply to the open space zoning criteria. And as I read it, it, it doesn't give any distinction in between town lines or anything. It, it gives a rather broad statement of purpose. The purpose of this article is to incorporate into the zoning ordinance tools that will better enable the town to implement its policies as expressed in the comprehensive plan, to preserve open space and the rural character, and to provide opportunities for affordable housing. These tools are designed to achieve these goals while respecting the rights of property owners. And I don't see a distinction there in that uh, that would suggest that the rights and uh, issues related to these properties and the locations of those properties shouldn't be taken into consideration. And we'd request that you folks uh, do so and keep that in mind. Um, perhaps more to the point, back to the issue of the practical difficulty test. As I'm sure, that Mr. Chairman, you have reviewed and the other board members are familiar, I, I read it as a, a, a two-point examination. Practical difficulty means that the strict application of the ordinance to the property precludes the ability of the petitioner to pursue a use permitted in the zoning district in which the property is located. Prong one, demonstration that you're precluded from pursuing a use in the district where the property is located. And if you want to examine where the, the uses that are allowed in the ordinance, you just go to the RC zone and there's that list of those things that are permitted uses. I don't think there's been any evidence that's presented here, a position indicating that a use that's allowed under those provisions of the ordinance would be precluded. And the second is that results in this significant economic injury to the petitioner. <clears throat> 
I don't see how logically one could make a finding that there's been a preclusion of use. What I think is at issue here is the scope and the extent of that use. Again, in Mr. Fristacci's rebuttal remarks, he said, you know, I could build a ranch house in there, but it might not be the ones that the market would find most favorable. I don't think the standard for variances is, the, is to allow individuals to come forward and maximize economic opportunities or maximize the use of their lands. I think uh, Mr. Parkinson would agree with me that variances are supposed to be jealously granted. <clears throat> As regarding the economic injury test, I think that's what's been for you. There's been some suggestion that Mr. Fistacci may find himself at a disadvantage if these adjustments to the side setbacks that he's now requesting are not granted. But again, I don't think that's the criteria under the ordinance that he needs to satisfy. And as you know, it's, those aren't the only, that's not the stopping place in, place in the analysis. If you satisfy those elements, you still have to go on and make a conclusion. And I would ask that the board do this and state these points in the record as you review these is that the need for that you have to make a conclusion that the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. This is a large undeveloped tract of land in Cape Elizabeth. What is so unique about this property that it now needs to come before you to seek special permissions to allow some elements of development that are clearly allowed otherwise under the ordinance? <clears throat> I haven't seen anything in the record or been presented here that makes this lot unique in their circumstances. There was some discussion last time about sort of the more generic need for a variance. You have a very small single lot, and really somebody can't do a whole lot with it. But what's being proposed here is somebody's presenting a plan. They're the ones that's drawing the lines on the map, and they're suggesting now that somehow they're limited in what they can do and what they, what they can aspire to do with this property. That's not the standard to grant a variance. There's also that standard that the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood, will not unreasonably detrimentally affect the appraised market value of abutting properties. We had some discussion at the last meeting about shadows and we had the demonstration. If these buildings are allowed to go in and there's a certain height there, there's that issue of the shadow that you folks need to consider. But I think more importantly, there's also the issue of the elimination of privacy on an adjoining property without an effort to mitigate the loss of privacy. There's been nothing in this record which is presented to you folks that I think you could allow you to conclude that there's adequate elements or restrictions on the proposed development that are going to satisfy this concern of the privacy of these people that already live in this neighborhood. The next element that you have to make a finding on is the practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. Now, Mr. Fastaci argued that somehow he's pressed into this because of the discontinuance of these two roads over here. But again, this is a plan. This is a, 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 an opportunity for him to pursue one type of development on his property. And he's at the controls. So to make the conclusion that this is somehow not the result of his own actions, I don't think you can get to that conclusion. This, is the, this plan is the subject of his own design. There's accommodations that can probably make, be made with this, and he has the burden of showing that and demonstrating it to you. And then lastly, he has to show, there's two other ones that I don't think we spent much time on. One is the natural environment, adverse impact to the natural environment. The other is related to shoreland, <laughs> which I don't think are applicable here. But there has to be a demonstration that there's no other feasible alternative to a variance available to the petitioner. Now ask yourself that question. Are there alternative uses for this property that could be pursued by this gentleman? I suggest to you that he has to prove that there are no other feasible alternatives, and that the record before you is, is woefully short on that point. I will uh, be available to answer any other questions or concerns that, that board members might have, and, and uh, we appreciate your time and ask you to proceed and uh, think about our issues in your deliberations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crawford. Just to clarify, the arguments that you just made, were those addressed toward the 50 foot from the South Portland building envelope issue? Because I understood you to say earlier when you stood up that your clients um, 
do not object to the side yard variance of five That's feet. That's correct, because it's just an accommodation and appeasement. Our concern is the distance between the structures that are proposed and the, the existing um, buildings in the Charlotte Street and uh, on Gowdy Street in the Dana Park neighborhood. So you're, you're addressing the 50-foot building envelope issue with yes, I am. the practical tip. And I'm also suggesting that I don't think there's any other, I don't think the, that you folks can, irrespective of if, whether that issue applies or not, based on the presentation in this proceeding, I don't think that a variance is indicated and that Mr. Fristacci has satisfied his burden to, to persuade you and provide evidence on all of these points. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have, and I, perhaps I should have made note of this when we started the hearing, in the packet that all of the board members received, we have a drawing. I don't know. I don't know who it came from, um, but it is a drawing apparently issued by the Planning Board, City of South Portland, dated September 25, 2001. Um, Mr. Smith. Where did this come from? Which one of the parties provided this? Uh, it came from the planning department. It was shared. So this wasn't submitted to us by either one of the parties? It was parties submitted to case? the planning department, who in turn submitted to us. Uh, actually, Sachi had some. You copied that, didn't you? We had one from the planning department, but I think Mr. Sachi provided those. This was submitted in my supplementary packet to identify side and rear setbacks on abutting properties. I think we'll see on that uh, the side setbacks are six feet on either side and the rear setback is also six right. feet. Right. No, I can see what's on here. I just didn't know yes, I, where I, the... I submitted that okay. for a point of information so that you would see what the abutting properties in South Portland have for their setbacks and how close that they can build uh, to the land in question. Mr. Crawford, were you aware that the board was provided copies of these? Actually, no, I wasn't, Mr. Chairman. Well, maybe we should, to make the record clear, go through what we were provided with so that you are aware of what we have in our packet. You're looking now, Mr. Crawford, at the planning board yes, document from South uh, Portland? <coughs> Excuse me. This is a plan that was uh, apparently uh, prepared by Herbert P. Gray of South Portland, and that's, <coughs> I think it's stamped with his seal and name. Yes. Might, might I just have a moment? Yes, it's certainly. This is my client. chance to discuss this plan with uh, Mrs. Sawyer, and I'm advised that this is not the final plan that was uh, prepared on this issue, and I'd like to reserve the right. Apparently, there was some adjustments and some corrections made to this plan, and uh, Mrs. Sawyer advises that in the notes up here, it talks about the minimum rear side setbacks, that the now amended plan, which is of record, should read as follows. Minimum rear yard setbacks for principal structures under the current South Portland zoning ordinance in the residential A zone are 20 feet. Then it should say, instead of front, it should say rear and side setback requirements are the same for principal and accessory structures, which are six feet. So instead of front and side, uh, it should say rear and side. That's correct. <clears throat>
Should the second word in that remain rear? Should that be front? Elizabeth, can you help me? It appears that these are reversed. Sawyer advises that the way this should read, and what we'd like to do is, is actually submit the amended plan, is that, and Ms., uh, Dr. Chapman is correct, is that this side, the minimum rear and front setbacks for principal structures is 20 feet. If it's an accessory structure, the rear and side setback is 6 feet. Is that correct? Okay, it, and we'll it get might you. be 25 feet for front. That's all okay, I don't we'll know. We'll get you the rear. It's 20 for with front. With that caveat, can you clarify? Yeah, th this document has been recorded with the registry. I, I'm still not quite sure I know exactly what was That's changed. That's why I'd like to get you the actual plan, if I might, because I, we're just paraphrasing now based on recollection, and I'd really like to have the accurate plan before the board as, as part of your as part of your documents. I, I'm sorry, I wasn't aware this had even been presented to you. Can you clarify for the record how Mrs. Sawyer is so familiar with this document? This, this particular document? Yes, please. The Sawyer's in, in uh, communications with the planner for the Cape, uh, Maureen O'Meara, were advised that this very restriction that we were talking about or this very consideration about the distance between building envelopes wouldn't apply to these houses in South Portland because when they were built, there was no building envelope on a plan of record. So she advised them that if there was a plan of record, they would defer to those building envelopes. In other words, this, re this requirement would come in place because it would be building envelopes of record. So the residents of the neighborhood here hired a surveyor to identify and to place on a plan that they have their actual lot holdings, the building envelopes of records so that they could be protected accordingly. And that was what that process was all about. I, I think I referenced it in my first letter to the planning board that this was an issue that we had and we were proceeding to address it. Good. Did the building envelopes formally exist, registered with the county at the time that Mr. Pistachio's application came before? Elizabeth? Um, I'm not sure I can. Uh, the plan has never been submitted to the county. No, it was submitted to the county. It was the date that was submitted to the county. Did that predate the submission by Mr. Fristache? Oh, to this board? To Elizabeth. To the zoning board, you mean? Well, he went to the planning board first. They passed it to the zoning board. I don't know what the. Oh, wait, well, I think what Mr. Keneally is asking is whether there was any effort by the neighbors to establish building envelopes in South Portland before Mr. Fristashi proposed his Blueberry Ridge uh, subdivision. Well, not, not to, to play with words, but before he submitted his application to this zoning uh, board of appeals, had the neighbors made an effort an attempt to establish building envelopes around their South Portland properties. Board of Appeals, yes. But it wasn't recorded until after these proceedings. I think it was actually approved by the South Portland Planning Board the same night, the same night of the uh, last meeting of this board. So it had been prepared, but it hadn't been approved by the Planning Board for recordation in the Registry of Deeds. Because it was September 11th, it was planned yeah. I, unfortunately, we're not picking up the comments that are being made over here. Is this Mrs. Sawyer this speaking? Mrs. Sawyer. Should I have her come up and explain? Um, I think that might be helpful. And uh, Mr. Crawford, Mrs. Sawyer is one of your clients? Yes, Mrs. As, Sawyer is one of my clients. As is her husband, yes. Mr. Sawyer? They live on, uh, in this house here uh, off of Charlotte Road. So and, 
And am I correct that Mr. Sawyer is a member of the South Portland Planning Board? Yes, that's correct. And he was, he was absent at the meeting. Um, we were here last time and our other neighbors were at the South Portland Planning Board having this plan approved. After the plan was approved, it was, it was realized there was an error in the way that the language was written. So last Tuesday night, last, uh, was it, two, uh, we, it was two weeks ago tonight, the South Portland Planning Board had a consent item on their agenda to have an amended plan, and that was recorded the following day, on Wednesday, uh, two, weeks, two weeks from tomorrow, it was recorded. Now, the reason why the plan was begun was because, more, as Mr. Crawford stated, Maureen O'Meara, we came out and saw prior to the workshop of uh, the planning board, at which the first time we had an opportunity to see any kind of a plan, um, Maureen O'Meara told us, if you had building envelopes recorded on a plan, we would respect those. And those were almost her exact words. And that is why we had our building envelopes recorded on the plan. And it was supposed to be on September 11th, and that planning board meeting was canceled for obvious reasons. Sure. The building envelopes exist primarily for the purpose of as far as As far as we were concerned, we always had building envelopes because they were defined by the setback boundaries, which are six feet from the rear, you can have an accessory structure. You can't have a principal structure any closer than 20 feet from the rear pr property line. So we, it was our belief that the 50 feet from the building, from building envelope to building envelope was part of um, one of the trade-offs that you do when you do an open space subdivision, which is if you have an existing subdivision, you respect uh, a reasonable distance to existing properties. So as far as we were concerned, this exercise, which was quite costly, um, really shouldn't have been necessary, but we did it in order to protect ourselves because of advice from the planning director here in Cape Elizabeth, thinking that it was our only hope that we were gonna have any privacy. Okay, thank you. All set on that plan? Um, Sorry for the diversion. I, I think so. Um, however, I'm, a little concerned about your desire to want to provide us with the amended plan, I'm suggesting that perhaps we shouldn't take any action until that additional material is submitted to us. Um, oh, great. Well, that makes it easier. If we're going to have it tonight. I, I guess so. I guess that's why the sudden departure of a couple of the, okay. my clients. Um, because I was about to offer that we not consider this document, the amended subdivision plan, as it was given to us, if it's not correct, rather than defer discussions on this until next month to await another submission. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, might we just uh, have the 10 minutes or so? Sure. I think we'll still be talking 10 minutes from now. Now, as, but before you leave the podium, let's make sure you know what other things we've received. Sure, so there are no other surprises. Let me, can I make a comment about something you about your introductory remark? I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Peel. I have a little trouble hearing. I think okay. you're at perfect frequency um, that I have lost a little bit. You referred to a purpose statement, which oh. is the purpose under the general standards of uh, uh, Article 7. There is a purpose statement under Section 19-1-2, which is the purpose for the, the entire zoning ordinance. 19-1-2. It's on page 1 of the zoning, uh, zoning book. And um, well, I want to tread on this very carefully, um, but it does say the purpose of this ordinance is to promote the health, safety, and general welfare of the residents of Cape Elizabeth. You mentioned there was no reference to 
being town specific in the purpose statement that you referred to, but I'm referring you back to the overriding purpose statement, which does refer to the regulations of the ordinance protecting Cape Elizabeth. Um, that's not to imply that we don't have any concerns about the residents of South Portland, but the purpose of the zoning ordinances are to protect the residents of Cape Elizabeth. And that, I think, is consistent with what our attorney has counseled us to. I appreciate that. Okay. Okay, well, just going back to the packet that we received, I have a letter addressed to me from uh, Mr. Haddo dated October 12. It shows a copy, uh, Mr. Crawford. Uh, sent to you. Um, and it's the letter where he starts out saying that since the last meeting, Mr. Fristashi has decided to narrow his variance request and withdraw his request for the rear line setback. So I assume that is correspondence that you're familiar with. And you're welcome, of course, to see any of these. Um, we have It's a three-page handwritten document uh, that came in Mr. Fristashi's packet that says a majority of the structures abutting this, the Blueberry Ridge subdivision is greater in size than what the applicant is currently allowed to build. The average setback of the properties abutting the proposed subdivision is less than 15 feet. Um, and there are a couple of pages of attached figures and you're welcome to look at this if it's not something that you have. I don't have that. I could probably get a copy from uh, Bruce at some time. Okay. We have um, two drawings that were submitted to us. Uh, by Mr. Fristashi. One is the entire Blueberry Ridge uh, drawing showing the five foot side setbacks highlighted in yellow. We have a drawing that is a portion of the Blueberry Ridge subdivision. It shows lots 8 through 14 with lot 12 highlighted showing the existing building envelope and a requested building envelope. We have some pages of, look like they're from the, it's Cape, Elizabeth tax. Cape Elizabeth's tax assessor's records showing various properties in Cape Elizabeth. Um, actually, these appear to be showing properties on Gowdy Street and on Charlotte Street, why would these be from the town of Cape Elizabeth? Well, some of these must be from South Portland. Some South Portland, some Cape Elizabeth. Some are from South Portland, some are from Cape Elizabeth. And we have several pages um, of those. We haven't had any comment on them tonight, and I'm not quite sure what specifically they're intended to show, but they were in our packet. I, I don't have Um, also delivered in the packet was a copy of my letter sent to you and Mr. Haddo, dated September 27 after the last hearing. Um, a copy of your letter dated October 2, back to me, responding to my letter. Um, a copy of a letter dated October 4 from your legal assistant, clarifying one of the paragraphs of your letter. Um, a copy of Mr. Haddow's October 2 letter to me, 
um, that showed a copy to you, simply confirming that um, he and Mr. Fristashi had no objection to site visits. And a copy of a letter uh, to me that was copied to the other members of the board from Mr. Tranfaglia, one of our board members, uh, that was responding to my September 27 letter that went out to all of the, that went out to you and Mr. Haddow as well as the other members of the board. And you are welcome to see any or all of those. And I apologize, Mr. Crawford. I was not aware that you did not have these. Um, I should have at the beginning of the hearing perhaps put on the record that we had those. And I'll be glad to take a break at this point perhaps and give you an opportunity to review what we have. That's okay. I don't think there's anything there that's of any great consequence or surprise. Um, probably not, but still, um, to give you an opportunity to see what we have and comment on it, I certainly want to give you that opportunity. Okay. So if you would like that opportunity, um, you know, I'll be glad to take a 10 minute break, let you look at it and see whether you feel based on that amount of time you need additional time. We can do that. Uh, just a couple points of order. And, and I have additional documents. There's my letter of September 25th to the board uh, that I think I directed to you, um, which was basically my outline of points concerning both applications. And then I also have uh, oh, Your letter dated September 25th? Yes, well, that we had at the last hearing. Okay. I thought we were confirming everything. That so, no, I was just, I'm sorry, I was just confirming the things that we received in our packet in preparation for tonight's hearing. And I was not listing things that we were, that we had at last month's hearing. Okay. These were just new items given to us since last month's hearing. La right, since last month's hearing. If it's uh, an appropriate time for me to do that, Mr. Chairman, whatever. Well, why don't we uh, take a break for 10 minutes and let you look at all of those. And if you decide you need additional time, you can let us know at the end of that. So let's uh, adjourn for 10 minutes. As, uh, in each of the board members' packets, and we've made, uh, I think, satisfactory arrangements to obtain copies of the same. And also during the break, uh, what arrived is the amended plan that was uh, referenced earlier this evening. And uh, we're going to be making arrangements to get plans to you folks. We'll leave it to you uh, at this time, and then pick it up perhaps at the end of the meeting so that I can make arrangements to get adequate copies to everybody. I would like to uh, read into the and I don't think we all need copies. I think okay. the only, we only need one copy for the two copies, Mr. Smith says, Certainly. for the that. board's records. But we don't need one for each of the board members. OK, that's, that's, that's even better. It'll happen faster. Um, I would like to, just so it's clear, read the, the note, which is the subject of the revision, just so that everybody understands uh, the scope of the uh, changes. The second paragraph of the note uh, reads as follows. Minimum front and rear yard setbacks for principal structures under the current South Portland zoning ordinances in the residential A zone are 20 feet. Minimum side yard setbacks for principal structures are 6 feet. However, buildings higher than 30 feet shall have side and rear yard setbacks not less than 50% of the building height. 
The minimum rear and side yard setback requirements for accessory structures are six feet. So that's the change that hopefully helps clarify the scope of the uh, building envelopes. Um, in all other respects, is the does the document appear to be the same as the one that that we have? I believe in all other respects the document appears to be the same. So I think the, the is that this plan is dated October 9th, 2001, instead of September 25th, 2001. It appears that those are the only substantive changes. Okay. Could you read that first sentence again, please, of the amended? Sure. Could you reread that? Sure. The uh, second paragraph of the amended plan reads as follows. Minimum front and rear yard setbacks for principal structures under the current South Portland zoning ordinances in the residential A zone are 20 feet. Okay. A then is this drawing correct? It appears that it shows the rear setback at six feet of the building envelope. I believe that the uh, building envelope that's identified here includes the building envelope that would allow the uh, installation and construction of accessory structures, which is six feet. It says for principal and accessory structures. I, I didn't understand that question. It says the requirements are the same for principal and accessory structures, which are six feet. The very last one. That well, I, I, I think the confusion here, Mitch LaPlante, is that you're looking at a different document than Mr. Crawford's looking at. Mr. Crawford is looking at the revised one. You're looking at right. the original one. The last paragraph of the second pair of, this, of the revised plan mm -hmm. Please read it. reads, the minimum rear and side yard setback requirements for accessory structures are six feet. So that's the difference there. Principal structures is 20 feet front and rear. Accessory structures, six feet uh, for rear and side. I hate to do this to you, but can you just parcel out and just tell us just the side ones? Because we've got front, rears, and sides. I think just to clarify, strip everything else and just read the Sure. Side, side. For side setbacks, yep. according to the revised plan, yep. minimum side yard setbacks. This is the third line of paragraph two. For principal structures are six feet. However, buildings higher than 30 feet shall have side and rear yard setbacks, not less than 50% of the building height. Minimum rear and side yard setback requirements for accessory structures are six feet. It, is it, would you say it's typical to show a building envelope depicting accessory structure? I would not. I mean, typically, I would, I would say that a building envelope would have bearing on a principal structure, not accessory structures. And, and so I find it a little bit unusual that that the depicted building envelope is based on accessory structures. I guess um, I'm not familiar enough to. This is from the table of the ordinance. Uh, Mrs. Sawyer has just brought over the Cape Elizabeth uh, zoning ordinance, section 16-1-4 definitions that defines building envelope. And at least under the CAPES ordinance, the area, the building envelope is defined as the area within a lot where the main and accessory buildings shall be located. So I think in anticipation of that definition, this was prepared to show the, I guess the outer bounds, if you will, of the setback to include the accessory structure. Thank what you. What section was that? No, that was not from the CAPES zoning ordinance. Well, not from, 16, well, yeah, it's from a different part of our ordinance. It's not the zoning. Well, whatever it is, it's section 16.1.4. It's under the definitions under subdivision regulation. Subdivision regulation, yes. Okay. No, you don't get it. 16.1.4. Just, that one.
Anything else? I, Mr. I Crawford? I, so. I think we have closure on the, the plan issue. I hope everybody's satisfied and we'll take care of those copies. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Haddow, I'm going to give you the last shot here since you are the applicant to the extent that you want to have any additional uh, response. Thank you. I will uh, briefly respond on a couple of points. Uh, I, I, I do want to emphasize here that Mr. Fristacci is no longer requesting and therefore there is not on the table before the board a request for a variance of the rear line setbacks here. Whatever argument we have about that, whether it involves building envelopes or no building envelopes or anything else, we're prepared to have that argument in front of the planning board. I will say that the discussion that we've just had over the course of the past several minutes, uh, excluding the 10 minute break, about how South Portland went about figuring out how to put building envelopes on lots where there never used to be any building envelopes before illustrates precisely the point that Mr. Parkinson made to you earlier this evening, which is the city of South Portland has a uh, comprehensive plan. It has a set of zoning ordinances. It has its own set of uh, rules that apply to the establishment of building envelopes that are completely different from the rules that, that apply here. And moreover, the planning board of the city of South Portland, which established these particular building envelopes very recently, is a body of officials elected by the citizens of South Portland with absolutely no fealty to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, as we learned uh, in earlier proceedings. So all of those things point out precisely why it makes perfect sense for the for Cape Elizabeth not to consider those. Again, in any event, that's irrelevant. It doesn't matter because we're not here asking for rear line setback variants. We're here asking for sideline setback variants. And what we've done between the last session and this session is put before this board the evidence that Mr. Fristacci took this piece of property on which this use that he is proposing is a permitted use. He hired an engineer to design a plan that would pay him back a reasonable return only on his investment in this land. And that engineer, Mr. Manthorne was here last time we met, spoke about the feasibility of changing these lots around or having fewer lots or moving them further away, and essentially said to you, from my perspective as an engineer, this is the plan that makes the most sense in terms of returning something to Mr. Fristacci, in terms of using this land in a way that's permitted under the ordinance. Now, what Mr. Crawford has argued is that there are other uses permitted or this, this use could be, this permitted use could be done in a different way. Well, saying that we have to show that these variances are required in order for the use to be feasible doesn't mean that we have to negate every other theoretical possibility. We've come forward and shown this board why this is the plan that makes sense financially and otherwise and why this plan requires, in order to be feasible, a relaxation of the sideline setbacks. I, to be honest with you, I'm not sure that I'm really arguing against anyone here because it's not clear to me that what Mr. Crawford was saying was that he has a problem with sideline setbacks. To the extent that he does, to the extent that he does, I believe that we've established that the relaxation of the sideline setbacks is necessary in order to permit the construction of buildings not only that are consistent with the, these buildings in size alone even, with these buildings that surround it, but also that will provide a return that will permit Mr. Prestacci to do this other than at a loss. So those are the basic precepts on which we submit this request for a variance to this board. I do just want to say one, uh, make one further point, which is that uh, I believe Mr. Crawford made reference to uh, uh, variances being, I think he said, jealously granted. 
there is a fair amount of case law that stands for the proposition that variances should be uh, handed out very, very parsimoniously. That case law, however, predates the statute that amends the variance standard to permit towns to allow variances based on practical difficulty. That was the old undue hardship standard. And the fact of the matter is that that language in those cases is no longer applicable. The point is obviously there was a decision made in the legislature that there are circumstances like these in which a variance is an appropriate remedy, even though the landowner might be able to uh, realize a reasonable return on the property through some other means. So those are the points that I think are important to pick up in rebuttal, and I thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you. Mr. Fristacci, would you like to say something? You had a question before the break about uh, why you received the assessor's uh, charts, property charts. Those were submitted to you for um, a couple of reasons. One, to show documented proof, documented evidence from a reliable source, and it's from Cape Elizabeth and South Portland assessor's offices, to show where the comparisons came from. Comparisons came from those assessors' uh, charts, building charts. It also was to establish something else, and we didn't talk about that this evening, and I feel it's important that we do. Uh, the average size setback on these properties. The uh, document that uh, was discussed before the break and after the break the plan that was submitted to the uh, Cumberland County Registry of Deeds that was in error and is, is corrected. The property, the lots never changed. The lot sizes, they documented one Herbert Gray's um, survey. <clears throat> With the lot sizes, I took the assessor's charts, building, um, building cards, and put the building out or the, the building footprint on his map and subtracted the overall width of the building from the overall width of the lot and established average setbacks. The average setbacks, I believe, are 11.5 or 11.8 feet. And that is from the average. What I'm asking for is something greater than what is on the properties, the surrounding properties on this subdivision. So there were two reasons why you, why you received those, uh, that packet, uh, that packet of information, to document and justify that, that my request is not unreasonable based on the surrounding properties in the, in the immediate neighborhood. What is the average building width that you propose? Well, the, the average building lot, the, uh, the width of the, the building envelope is going to be when you consider, now, this request to ask for five feet, it might maximize uh, three, four, excuse me, four lots on the Gowdy Side Street uh, property. But on lot 19, the average building might be 30, 32 feet because of the, of the, um, the physical limitation on that particular property. Same with 14. It's narrow. 13 is very narrow. Um, the average... So on like lots 18, 17, 16, what, what do you envision? So the, the building envelope would be 60, 60 feet wide, and you'd want to come in a couple of feet because you don't want to come back to a zoning board and ask for a variance if you place the building in the wrong location. So it's probably going to be approximately 58 feet wide, maybe 56 feet wide. Right. If they have an outside fireplace, that has to be part of the structure. So you have to allow for that. So it might be 50 feet, 56 feet wide on these four. Here will be narrower. Here will be narrower. And in doing so, when you build a smaller house, the overall price of that home is going to be reduced down. So that's why I said earlier, the average cost is going to be seventy-five dollars to $85,000, depending on the particular lot. And that limits you as what you can get on a reasonable return. 
but someone will pay for a property. Um, we were talking about what could go on. What? Mr. Crawford was saying what type of a house. Someone isn't going to pay $190,000 for a small ranch without a garage or without a deck. So each lot is a challenge. So the answer might be between 45 and 55 feet wide. What do you propose just for an average height? And I, I realize that given what you said that they're going to vary, but what would one of the higher buildings be? It would probably be, you would probably see a two-story house with um, seven, six, uh, seven point six, uh, seven and a half uh, foot yeah. ceilings. So you're talking uh, 15 plus, you're probably talking certainly under 35 feet. Uh, well, it has to be, right? These are not going to be the large homes that you're seeing in, in um, uh, other, other parts of the town. Um, Cross, Cross Hill is one, one area. These will not rival the, the size that they have. These will probably not rival the homes uh, on uh, Abaco Road, which is another subdivision that's pre-Perkins decision, which has setbacks uh, down to, uh, to 10 feet. 10 foot uh, side setbacks. So we will not have the height that you experienced there. Okay. So you think they'll be, will they be around 30 or 35? Um, I'm going to say, well, they're going to be in that vicinity. The average, Bruce, what is the average height of a building? That will, okay. Um, you're going to be talking somewhere around 30, 33 feet high. I say that because I remember now what a mason figures the price of a, a chimney, 34 feet high. <clears throat> Joe, what's the price range that you're looking at for the houses? The market will determine it. Depends on where it's going to be next year. I, I realize that. <coughs> I know it's impossible to project. Just well, based on current market. Take take three times the cost of your lot. So it's two hundred twenty-five thousand, maybe to two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. I alluded to one subdivision that uh, preceded the Perkins decision. Another one that uh, also had reduced side setbacks, uh, reduced setbacks from <coughs> building envelopes, and reduced setbacks from roads, existing roads, is another one that Joel Fitzpatrick uh, is doing, and that's Whaleback subdivision off the um, uh, old Ocean House Road. So a precedent has been established there. The, the ordinance, that is a cluster or an open space zoning subdivision, and that has the reduced setbacks on it. So you're not doing anything new. The only thing that's new is the step that we have to come before you before we go to the planning board. Thank you. Mr. Sawyer? David Sawyer, 10 Charlotte Street, South Portland. Just one uh, technical question I have for either Mr. Pistachio or Mr. Haddow. The uh, line on uh, uh, lots 13 and lot 11 that I'm going to point to, are these considered, uh, and maybe this is a question of the code officer, I don't know. Are these considered side lines or rear lines? This one here and this one over there. Would it be a side setback or a rear setback? Uh, without, that's, that's my question. Without answering your question specifically, what I can tell you is that if you look at the plan, the setbacks that show on the plan for those lines are 20 feet. So we're not looking for a variance on this on this uh, setback, which would be the setback against your property from 13, uh, from 11, sorry, or on this setback, which is the one from 13 to the Fog property. That's yeah. I no understand point. the way it's gone. I was just wondering if the board did grant the sideline areas. As a broad statement, would somebody maybe misconstrue that sometime as applying to those lines? Why? I think that what the board has as part of its app of our application is this plan with the with the with the lines marked in yellow. 
where the setback is requested. And there's a dotted line to indicate where the setback is requested. So I, I think, assuming that that's part of the package and that's part of the approval, it would be pretty clear what, what it is we've requested. Is there anyone else here in the audience not represented by council who wishes to speak for or against the application? Okay. In that case, we are ready to close the public comment portion of the hearing. And open this up for discussion by members of the board and ultimately to vote on the application. Um, I think I'd like to start the discussion, if I may, by just saying that I think we should focus on the application as it's submitted and as amended by the withdrawal of the request for the rear uh, sideline setback, the, the rear lot line setback, I guess is the right way to refer to it, without consideration of the 50-foot building envelope issue. Um, it seems to me that not even going as far as Mr. Parkinson has gone as our counsel, and I respect the advice he's given us that we don't need to consider the South Portland building envelopes, I don't think we need to go quite that far as to say that we're going to disregard the South Portland building envelopes. Um, as I read the ordinance, um, our task here is limited to granting the variance on the sideline setback which is being requested uh, from 20 feet to 15 feet. The building envelope is something that will be established by the planning board. And the arguments that Mr. Crawford uh, has made to us, um, it seems to me, should be properly presented to the planning board. So to the extent that we've heard the arguments once, I think they get two bites at the apple but I think that the right place for those arguments to be made is to the planning board. Um, again, custom and practice um, has dictated that building envelopes um, are established at the planning board level, um, not, not at the zoning board. And as I read and understand the, um, the Perkins case, um, we don't even need to address the building envelope issue. That was a case where the planning board was taking over a function that by law, by the legislature, was properly a zoning board issue. And our ordinance under Perkins requires that an issue that is by statute a zoning board issue be addressed by the zoning board. And by statute, this board is required to address variances, but there's nothing in the statute that requires that this board address uh, building envelopes. So I don't think the 50 foot, the 50 foot building envelope <coughs> issue is something that we um, even need to uh, discuss and address. But certainly as part of this discussion, um, I think any board member who has input on that you know, should voice that now. Simply, uh, just agree with your interpretation. I think that our job here today is really strictly consider the the variance for the side setbacks that Mr. Pistachio has presented, um, and see us getting into trouble if we go into the building envelopes. So, I think we should just stick with the strict variance considerations. <coughs> I agree. I appreciate you making that introductory comment. Uh, part of our discussion. I, 
had that same matter in my mind, that it's not our business to deal with the definition of the envelopes or what the appropriate setback is from the property line to the South Portland residences. Um, I will make a comment of a different tenor. I, I really overall believe that this plan uh, is not consistent, not inconsistent rather, with the character of the South Portland neighborhood that it abuts. And as already pointed out, I believe that uh, many, if not most, of the houses um, that will be in this new development will be no larger than many of the houses in the South Portland neighborhood, um, side setbacks. Uh, even if we approve the variance from the setback, will be larger than the side setbacks of the existing houses in South Portland. So I. Uh, I'm sensitive to their concerns that something's going to be built there. I think that when people abut vacant land, they never like to see anything built on it. They've enjoyed that vacant land and its views and its natural character for some length of time. But, uh, ultimately, something will be built here, and I believe that the development as proposed is uh, very consistent with the character of the South Portland neighborhood. Dr. Chapman. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to address a question to town council, Mr. Parkinson. Uh, I'd appreciate your comments for the board uh, on your view of, the, of our ability or the zoning board ability at this time to uh, grant a variance for this subdivision in view of the um, position of the subdivision in relation to the planning board and the definition <coughs> of these lots in relation to the planning board. Uh, in view of the fact that this is a subdivision that's in the uh, formative stage and not having been uh, previously approved uh, in regards to concept or lot definition. I'd appreciate your comments regarding that. Please. <coughs> um, that's a, a very good question, one that I've been thinking about uh, prior to coming here. Um, as I mentioned before, the Perkins decision, um, like it or not, has uh, forced some issues um, from the planning board over to the zoning board. and. Um, it almost becomes sort of a, a, a chicken and egg question is uh, whether the zoning board is able to consider something that doesn't currently exist on the face of the earth. In other words, these aren't lots in existence right now. These are lots that are proposed in concept. Um, the uh, Perkins decision has uh, complicated that uh, for you and, and there's not a solid answer. There's not a, uh, an answer that's grounded in the Perkins decision for answering that, but I'd suggest the following. Um, that there's got to be some place that either the, the planning board or the, um, um, uh, the zoning board of appeals where the applicant can get some redress on this issue or this address, this issue can be addressed. And I would suggest to you under Perkins that uh, has been, tr that authority has been transferred to you. And I think that uh, you should go ahead and um, deal with the question that's presented, even though, uh, in a sense, it's hypothetical in nature. And I suppose in your findings of fact, you should make it clear that obviously the variance, if you were to grant one, uh, only applies in the event that the lots are approved as configured um, by the plan in front of you, approved by the planning board. Um, um, pursuant to the plan <coughs> in front of you. In other words, your variance is a condition of your variance and you're able to impose conditions is that it's with the understanding the planning board does in fact approve those. Um, but I, I think otherwise the applicant, if you don't take this approach, the applicant's going to be kind of caught in a bureaucratic catch-22. It's not going to have any place he's going to be able to go uh, to ask for relaxation of those standards. And I think that the ordinance does contemplate Applicant having some place to go to do that, even even when the when the lots are on the on the planning board at the planning board stage. 
And a second part to that question, typically we are approached in the sense of a specific variance for a specific lot as opposed to a blanket variance for a, as you described, a, a, an undefined lot uh, subdiv subdivision and number of lots. Uh, would you comment on that? Uh, yeah. Well, a specific I, 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 versus general blanket. I, I can tell this board is, is detail oriented. And I think that in its, in its fi findings, it, it should say that if it were to grant the variance uh, um, to say that the uh, variance relates to uh, specific lot numbers as described on the plan that's presented, maybe even reference the date of the plan. So it's not, when you write your findings, don't say we're granting a blanket side yard variance. If you were to grant, uh, be inclined to grant that variance, I don't want to make that presumption that that's the direction you're heading. Um, if you were to grant it, that it would, it would apply not in a blanket sense to any side yard variances on the plan, but apply to the side yard variances that has specifically been requested between you know, 19 and 13, I believe. And the applicant can correct me if I'm wrong. It goes, it goes around. It's yeah. all but 12. All but 12, OK. Um, yeah, it goes, goes around. Uh, but you, you should be specific about what you're granting. Um, I, I think it would be a mistake to say, we've looked at the subdivision. We feel it meets all the criteria. And we've looked at the variance request. And side yard variances are granted. Be specific about what you're talking about. Tie it into a specific plan that's in front of you. This plan could change. That was my third question. What happens if the planning board rearranges this to some degree? Does it revert back to us again? I, I, I obviously, um, since we're, there's we're some, faced there's with some threshold where there might be some discretion given to the code officer that the plan is uh, the change in a way that's so de minimis that that it's not to be um, the, core, the the change is, is so minimal that it, it, it doesn't really matter. Some judgment is applied there. But if it's changed in any uh, sort of dramatic sense, then I, I think that they've got to come back and, and ask for you to uh, reaffirm what you did before because. Your thinking may change if this plan changes in, in some real, real way. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Chapman, I'll also point out that um, on page 200 of our zoning ordinance, this is a pretty esoteric section, yeah. but 19-9-3 um, on page 200, uh, says, where a proposed use is subject to approval of the Zoning Board of Appeals, such approval shall be obtained before the Planning Board considers the site plan, plan for the proposed use. So I think our ordinance um, actually addresses this sort of chicken and the egg question. That when something has to go to two places, it comes to the Zoning Board first before planning. So I think for that reason, it's properly before us, before it goes back to planning. Or maybe I should say before it goes to planning for the first time. Other comments? Well, I agree with Mr. Keneally's assessment um, of all the evidence as we've received it. I think that it, um, that under the open space zoning, um, that the development as proposed is consistent with the ordinance um, and meets the various elements of the practical difficulty standard. Um, and I intend to vote in favor of the various standards. <coughs> Mr. Trent Baglio. I can concur with you and Mr. Keneally. And I and Mr. Keneally gave, I think, authority based on uh, not only the town ordinance, but the uh, neighborhood. Um, and I think uh, it gives it more credence to me as it actually, I think, fulfills uh, the mission of the Cape Elizabeth uh, uh, comprehensive plan, um, as so much as we put on our town planning hats to a certain degree to, to, to deal with this uh, component before it goes there. Uh, so for the same reasons, plus I think further justification is that um, as you said, this land, uh, 
will be developed, uh, and I think it's being uh, developed in accordance with what the uh, comprehensive plan of the town is. I'm in agreement with the uh, chair's opening comments. Um, I found them very thorough and consistent with what we've been discussing, and uh, Mr. Keneally's argument was also um, to the point, and I, I think that the proposed development would fit in very well with uh, the surrounding community. Well, why don't we go through the various elements? Um, but actually, before we do that, I'd like to do one thing, and that is, We've had reference a few times, and we're undoubtedly going to have additional reference before we're done here, to this drawing that was submitted by Mr. Fristashi with the side setbacks highlighted in yellow. Um, I would like to have, unfortunately, there's no date reference on here that I can see that permits us to easily identify this. Um, so I'd like to give it some kind of a name and date reference so we can refer to it as such. Um, and I wonder if it would be appropriate simply to refer to this as, um, can we give it an exhibit number? Applicant's exhibit number one, October dated October 23, 2001. So what is it? Um, it's all of that. It's applicants exhibit number one, dated 10-23-2001. Um, going through the various elements required for approval of a variance under the practical difficulty standard. All those board members, uh, can I see a show of hands of all those board members who uh, find that there is no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance? Um, that element is found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Um, all those, uh, a show of hands of all those board members who find that a literal, a literal enforcement of the ordinan ordinance would cause a practical difficulty as defined by 30-A, uh, Main Revised Statutes Annotated Section 4353-4C, and recognizing that as part of this, um, a practical difficulty is defined as an occasion where the strict application of the ordinance to a property precludes the ability of the property owner to pursue a use permitted in the zoning district in which the property is located and results in significant economic injury to the property owner. And significant, um, significant economic in injury being defined as placing the applicant for a variance at a disadvantage in the neighborhood by applying zoning ordinance standards which would prevent the applicant from having a structure or accessory structure comparable in size, location, and number to those of other lot owners in the immediate neighborhood, but in no case fewer than 10 of the nearest property owners. A show of hands on that. That is found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Um, a show of hands of those board members who find that the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general circumstances of the neighborhood. That is found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Um, a show of hands of all those who find that the granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not unreasonably detrimentally affect the use or market value of abutting properties. And in determining whether a variance would have an unreasonable detrimental effect on the use or market value of abutting properties, owner of abutting properties, the zoning board shall consider if the variance would have the effect of blocking an established view, posing a fire safety hazard, casting a shadow on an adjoining lot, reducing the appraised value of an adjoining property by 10% or more, or eliminating the privacy of an adjoining property owner, of an adjoining property without an effort to mitigate the lost privacy. And the phrase undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood is defined um, as the result of a variance where the structure is larger or closer to the road or property lines than the average of the nearest 10 principal structures, or in the case of a variance request for an accessory structure 
the nearest 10 accessory structures. Um, a show of hands on that. That is found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Um, a show of hands of all those who find that the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. That is found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Um, a show of hands of all those board members who find that no other feasible alternative to a variance is available to the, to the petitioner, with no other feasible alterni alternative defined as, in the case of a variance request, there is no other place on the lot taking into consideration the physical constraints of the property, or no other location on the structure that the proposed construction could go without the need for a variance, or without causing the owner to create other compliance problems on the lot, because of the zoning ordinance, deed restrictions, or conditions imposed by a lease or contract. A showing of hands. And that is found in favor by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Uh, a show of hands of those board members who find that the granting of a variance will not unreasonably adversely affect the natural environment. And that is found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. And last, um, a show of hands of those board members who find that the property is not located in whole or in part within shoreland areas as described in Title 38, Section 435. And that is found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Uh, based on those findings, um, could I have a motion Um, from someone substantially as follows. Whereas four or, more, four or more voting members of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals have found that the applicant, Joseph A. Fristashi, has established that a practical difficulty exists with respect to the applicant's property I'm not quite sure how to refer to this uh, for the location. Um, uh, 138 Mitchell Road, um, tax map U38, lot 17, of approximately 16 acres, plus or minus. In accordance with the provisions of section 19-5-2, B1 of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance. And whereas four or more voting members of the board have found that the applicant has met the applicant's burden of proof in establishing that all conditions specified in section 19-5-2B1 have been met, I move that the application for a variance of five feet from the required 20 feet side, side property line. of the side property lines as reflected on applicants exhibit number one dated October 23, 2001. Be approved. Mr. Chair, one point Mr. of clarification. Smith. The majority of the lot is 8 Wood Rosewood Drive, map U34, lot 22 4. Excuse me, Bruce, David. At the planning board meeting, I believe it was in, I think it was in August, 138 Mitchell Road became part, we separated this land from 8 Rosewood Drive, created a separate lot. At that time, we merged 138 Mitchell Road into this lot. So I think that it would be correct to identify it 
if you need a street address. It's 138 Mitchell Road. Well, then we haven't advertised correctly then because it's 8 Rosewood Drive, tax map U34224 is what's advertised. Well, isn't well, 8 was... Rosewood Drive your personal residence? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Is the property at issue tax map U34 lot 17? This was the this was part of it when I when I made the application. U34224. Right. <coughs> That's the mother law. There was a small lot that, that he bought, incorporated that into um, before the access, but the, the, the lot itself is designated as tax map U34 lot 224. That was the original acreage, and that's hence advertised as such. And that's what we're subdividing. And that's how it appears on tonight's old business, tax map U34 lot 22. You seem to be looking for an address I, for the property. I was looking for an address to describe the property in the proposed motion, okay, well, and I was obviously looking at the wrong, the wrong address. I was actually looking at your application, where I got the U30, tax map U34 lot 17. Um, so it should be. Um, I'd amend my request for the motion, to read tax map U34 lot 22, dash, four. A lot containing uh, 16 acres, plus or minus. Um, um, and I'd also like to add that it be approved um, with the understanding that this matter will require additional planning board approval to, among other things, set the location of the building envelopes. One other, may I suggest, do you make sure. reference to the fact that we we're talking only about proposed lots, one through 11 and 15 through 19, in this motion? Uh, pardon me, but that was an error on my part. In terms of the sideline setbacks, as the plan shows, it's all, it's all 19. Side. Oh. Okay. It's lots one through nineteen for the side setbacks. Right. Okay. That's right. You did reference the exhibit and its pending approval based on substan substantially consistent with the plan as it exists today. Is that correct? Um, the proposed motion, as I phrased it, did refer to the side setbacks as reflected on applicant's exhibit number one dated October 23, 2001. And I think you should also add in that with careful attention being paid to the def or defining sidelines of these lots. As was noted, sidelines uh, or highlighted in yellow, of course, that won't show up in any type of recorded uh, document or permanent document. But clearly defined what is the sideline for each of these lots, consistent with this Exhibit A. Would it be your assertion that well, the sidelines only come into question on lots 13 and 11? Well, the only way I know how to define the proposed side setbacks on applicant's exhibit number one, dated 10-23-01, is by what is highlighted in yellow. This remains on file, am I correct? That's correct. So it, it, it does become a reference tool. Through the, through the process, you know, this, this, 
this will be the document that will be, oh, that's true. be carried through with the planning board with any changes that they may make. Uh, they're going to have to, you know, that'll come out of this board. Well, it will remain certainly part of this board's records and part of the code enforcement officer's file. And it will certainly be shared with the planning board so they can carry forth through the planning board process. I mean, the only other way to refer to it would be to mark them in some way other than in yellow with cross hatches or otherwise and take the time to mark all of the signs side setbacks. I just think it's important that we clearly define sidelines since we are issuing a, a, a variance referencing sideline setbacks. And I'll be Some happy. lots have more than two sidelines. For example, lot number 11 and, and, and uh, lot 13, which was mentioned by uh, a member of the audience. Uh, I, I, this should be clearly defined and not subject to interpretation at a later date. What, and, and, and if we can reference this and reference the yellow, then, then that makes me feel comfortable. Uh, I would actually like to see sidelines uh, defined in something that, that could be photocopied other than yellow. Well, let, me, let me ask for a clarification. I mentioned lot 11, which I guess is included in the motion as made. On the diagram here, we're looking at what I consider both sidelines and rear lines being highlighted in yellow. Um, am I to understand that the letter overrides this and does not ask for rear properties setback variants on lot 11? Um, the, the, the request is as depicted on the plan. And when you're talking about rear lines, I assume you're talking about the line that abuts the uh, WLB and Associates that's right. Property. Well, the, for purposes of this request, um, we treated that as a sideline and treated the line that abuts the Sawyer property as the rear line. So you have three, so, three sides. Well, co correct. And although, for example, on lot eight, we only have one sideline. Right. So it varies. But if you, but the, the best point of reference really is the the yellow marks, and uh, okay. I mean that's that 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 does describe the, se the sections where we're looking for the for the setbacks. And so someone should put together a copy of crosshatch on it rather than yellow. Yeah, if if that's a concern, we'd be pleased to do that. That's not a, that's, that's not difficult. We can put together a plan that shows crosshatches where all the yellow lines are now. Right. That's no problem. In fact, we can do that. As, I mean, if that's the, that's something the board wants for its records. We can do that in a matter of, you know, a couple of days. Well, I would think it's probably something you can do in a matter of about three minutes with a pen right actually, now. That, actually, that's true. But if, if there's a the plan here, I can probably sit here and do it, or Mr. Prestacci can. Uh, can you take this one down and do it? Mr. Chairman? The, yes. The uh, highlighted yellow areas are all double hatch boundary lines. And I think a definition. I don't see any exception is that the wherever you have, and that's where the variant is being painted, the first one. Well, actually, there are a number of double for example, lines. Four. Shows um, a double rear. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All have double right. lines. And those are all that are not highlighted. because those would be rears. That would be a rear setback, like in lot three, I believe. I don't, I don't know why this is a big problem. If this is, this is in yellow and it's going to go onto the planning board based on what's depicted here, the final plan will reflect what's, what you approved here, and I'll, you know, I'll carry that well, through. Well, I, I, I think sure. it's simply the, the idea that, that whatever our order is will be recorded. And to the extent that our order refers to then, then if that's the case, a, a plan, 
then you should have them do, do a plan that's recordable. Um, reflected. Otherwise, I, I guess our recording can refer to applicant's exhibit number one, dated 10-2301, that is part of the records of the town of Cape Elizabeth. Yes, could very easily be done that way. Mm -hmm. You could say that the applicant could supply the code officer with a planning report with form with five days and then we go back and make a look at the repair. Yep. Uh, does that work? Yes. Uh, Dr. Chapman, does that satisfy your concern? If the, um, if the applicant is required to provide uh, the town with a document in recordable form showing the uh, areas covered by the side setback in cross hatching or some other form of delineation that is visible and recordable? That'd be fine as long as it is clear to everybody involved what a sideline is for a particular line. However, uh, uh, cross hatch would, would certainly do that. Well, I appreciate your attention to detail, and I think it's a good point. Well, in that case, without restating the entire motion that I was proposing, um, I would uh, suggest that it be amended to refer rather to applicant's exhibit number one, uh, I'm sorry, rather than refer to the sideline setbacks highlighted in yellow on applicant's exhibit number one, dated October 23, 2001, that we refer to a plan to be submitted by the applicant in recordable form um, that is consistent with the um, sideline setbacks highlighted in yellow on applicant's exhibit number one, dated October 23, 2001, uh, with the documents submitted in recordable form to show the sideline setbacks in crosshatch or some other visual representation that will be apparent on a recorded document. So, with that having been said, is there, is anyone willing to make such a motion. Did you, I, I don't recall, did you apply that this is conditional to full approval of the reference plan by the Dickens List Planning Board? Yeah. I did. Okay. Good. So do we need to restate all of that? <laughs> Only if you make me. No, I so move. Uh, motion, Ms. Miller. Second. Second, Mr. LaPlante. Discussion on the motion. Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion? Opposed? The motion is approved by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Which takes us to the second item of old business on our agenda tonight. Mr. Backer, would you like to outline what's going to happen with, with the other two cases, especially the new business at this point? Do you think you'll be hearing it? Because if not, then the applicant really probably would like to hear that. Is Julie Hoare here? Uh, Julie, you want to come on up? To the podium. As a matter of, um, I think, rule rather than just practice, um, the board does not take up any new matters um, after 10 o'clock. 
Is it 10? Is that our time? That's correct. Um, we're about to take up one other item before yours that we could finish before 10, but there's an equally good chance, if not a better one, that we won't. If you want to stay, and if we finish the other one before 10 and get to yours, we'll be happy to get to you. But if, you don't, if you'd rather go home, you're welcome to. And we'll hear you next month. That's your choice. I just want to give you that option at this point. I mean, 10 o'clock isn't that far off. You've waited this long. If you want to wait another 35 minutes right, not to make that decision, you're welcome to. I'll have to stay, but thank you. You, you will stay? Yeah. Okay. The second item of old business on our agenda is to hear the appeal of Joseph A. Fristashi, 8, Fro 8 Rosewood Drive, Tax Map U34, Lot 22-4, for a setback variance of 45 feet from the required 75 feet from the building envelope of Lot 12 to the proposed Blueberry Ridge subdivision to Charlotte Road. Now someplace, I'm not sure where, I have that application. But Mr. Haddow, you're welcome to come to the podium and begin your presentation while I look for it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I will uh, make this extremely brief. Um, First of all, I, I, I want to make one point of clarification. I believe that on Applicant's Exhibit 1, which was submitted in connection with the last matter, you'll see that the proposed rear line setback on Lot 12 is now 25 feet. Since the distance between the end of Charlotte and the property line is also 25 feet, what Mr. Prestacci is asked, actually requesting is not a variance from, a, uh, uh, not a reduction to 45 feet, but a reduction to 50 feet. So it's five feet less of a variance than he, than he had been asking for. You follow me? So what he's looking for, in, in other words, is to go from a 70, from a 75 foot setback from the now end of Charlotte to a 50, set, 50 foot setback from the now end of Charlotte which translates into a 25-foot setback from the rear property line. Now, all I will uh, say is that all the arguments that we made with respect to the sideline setbacks apply with equal force here. In addition, however, lot 12 has the unique circumstance of being entirely unbuildable unless this variance is granted as required. There is simply no way that a lot can be that a, that a, that a home can be constructed on that lot unless uh, there's at least a uh, uh, well, what will, will, will amount to about a 40, uh, 40 foot deep building envelope there. So maybe not even quite that, 35 foot deep building envelope. So uh, just for I don't know if all of you can see this smaller uh, excerpt that's been put on the board here, but this shows uh, in blue what would be the, the, the building envelope if the 75 foot setback were to be enforced as it stands. The uh, area hatched in red is the area of building envelope that would be added, or the additional building available building area that would be added if, if that 75 foot uh, setback from Charlotte is relaxed to to 50 feet. So without anything further, and again, all the legal arguments are the same. Uh, the only difference here is that we have the additional characteristic of this lot that it is, as I said, entirely unbuildable without the requested variance. Mr. Fristashi, did you want to say anything on this? This lot is part of the whole parcel. 
Unfortunately, it's the end, at the end of a cul-de-sac, and it backs up to a discontinued street. The argument may be made later this evening to take this lot and basically have it, take half of it and add it to 13 and half to lot 11. That would reduce the number of lots down from 19 to 18, <coughs> excuse me, and therefore it will increase the average lot size to in excess of the mandated 9,000 square feet. It would increase it to approximately um, 9,350 square feet, which by the uh, mandated by the ordinance is not allowable. We looked at every other alternative possible as far as putting a, moving the lot closer to Fernwood Drive. In doing so, that would reduce the radius on the road to a point where the Public Works Director, Bob Malley, said you can't do that. Also, the city engineer uh, concurred and said that you cannot bring this cul-de-sac further and reduce that radius down. We looked at all, all the alternatives uh, possible on this particular lot. It has to be part of the subdivision. You can't cut it up, you can't subtract it, you can't add it to any other lots. You can't move it. Uh, the request from um, the 45 foot setback to the 50 foot setback, again, we're trying to be sensitive to the neighbors, give them the most that we can. We also want to be able to build a house that we can sell. And with a, you're going from a 10 foot setback, um, building width, to a 35-foot building width, and this would be typical with the houses in the neighborhood. So this, so lot 12 will have a 25-foot side setback no, under your proposal. No, 25-foot rear setback uh, to the property line. I'm sorry, did I say side? Yes. I, I'm sorry. The side setbacks. Rear would give us a, a, an opportunity to build a wider house on this lot so we don't have to go deeper. We'll probably have to be creative on this lot. But then again, in all subdivisions that have the open space zoning, two houses have to be designated as moderate income housing. And this possibly could be one. There are certain limitations on lots. There are certain limitations on lots, whether it be physical limitations or deed restrictions, which will maintain this as a moderately uh, priced home. Uh, questions for either Mr. Fristachi or his legal counsel? Is it, is it true that it has to be built on? Would that be a green space? No. No, it could not be green space. That, in effect, would be a vacant lot. Someone has to have ownership of it. Uh, I mean, it could be part of the green space that goes back to the no. town. No, if you do that, you'll increase, you'll increase the average lot size to over 9,000 square feet. If this, if this was dedicated as open space, then the, the, um, the number of lots will be reduced and the square footage of, of the, the average square foot of the other lots would be in excess of 9,000 square feet. Well, this is about a 9,000 square foot lot as proposed right now, so taking it out of the mix, mm -hmm. I don't see why the average that, is going to go up that much. That, that would become part of the open space area. Right. So now you're taking 9,000 or 8,900 square feet out of the out of the, the calculated amount. Um, Take 9,000 square feet in one house out of the calculated amount. I'm not going to. Well, you're dividing 18,000. Uh, I mean, 18 lots into 160,000, and the numbers are almost as 9,000, almost nine and a half, nine, 9,500. 
we talked about this, I think, last, last month. Uh, you can't take it out just because the numbers don't work. And I say the numbers don't I don't agree. Well, get your pencil out. And you take, take 100, if I take 160,000 square thousand, feet. If I take out one house and 9,000 square feet. The total land that's being developed is one, uh, 168,503 square feet. Right. You back out the square footage of this lot from that number. And let's just, for the sake of argument, let's call it 160,000 square feet. You divide that by the no number of lots, right. 18, and it's in excess of 9,000 square feet. And that is in excess of what is allowed in open space only. You cannot exceed the average lot size of 9,000 square feet in open space only. You look puzzled. Um, I'd have to do the calculation. So. One, yeah, actually, I appreciate all of that. Yes, please. So it's 100, and, what's, what's the current total space, Joe? 168,503. 168,503. Subtract 8927. And then divide by? Yeah, I get 8,865 square feet, average lot size. Divide by 18? I divide by 18. Took the lot out. Well, we figured it, and it and it came out to nine thousand. I got eighty-eight sixty-five, which was about what I expected. But I didn't trust my head, which is I appreciate the alarm. Yeah. Well, that's that's the planning board looks at subdivisions, and basically, you know, you're looking at the, the entity, the whole, the whole parcel. You're looking at the, the character, the overall character of the neighborhood. And if this lot is not built on, if it's just open space, how would you propose to treat it? Just as a vacant lot, who would maintain it? But these are questions that the planning board asks. So who's going to maintain the other open space? The town will maintain it. This is a separate, separate, separate lot. The town, the town I, I'm familiar with my own neighborhood. The town does own a few odd lots that are touching okay. the neighborhoods. I'm going to check the numbers that, that okay. we talked about earlier. More importantly, we gave argument on the last variance request that we need a certain number of lots to make this thing feasible to make it viable. We need the 19 lots to receive an adequate return. We've worked the numbers. We've got the cost for the road, co cost for the, the infrastructure, et cetera. We divide it by 19. If we divide by 18, that, that cost goes up substantially, and it doesn't make it feasible. So we need the 19 lots, more important than in my, my math. I think the numbers, we, we did work the numbers, though, uh, and, and I'll have to talk to Dick Manthon, the engineer. But uh, last week, the last month, they worked. I mean, they, they were in excess of 9,000 square feet. Dr. Chapman, what was your reasoning for requesting a 25-foot setback on this lot? To make it buildable. Instead of a 20-foot, for example. Instead of what? Instead of a 20-foot, like you did for the, the, the remainder for the rear setback. What was your reason for choosing 25-foot rear setback? 
Well, if you notice the, the arc in the road, that limits a lot of what you can do on either side of the, the building envelope and in front. So we were trying to build, uh, design a house that would be 35 feet and give the occupant what other people may have. And that may be a small deck on the rear of the house, um, a garage, the width of a house that, that, might, that might satisfy uh, today's buyer. No, I'm, I'm referring to the rear setback. You are allowed to approach the rear property line. Oh, in yeah, another what? situation, at, at 20 feet. Now, I realize we have a, 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 another uh, issue that we're facing here. But since you chose to deviate from the 75 feet, why did you choose 25 for the rear instead of the standard of 20 that 20 you are feet. for the re remainder of the properties? Well, the engineer decided that 50 feet might be a, a better number than a 45 foot. Okay. Setback. Um, I know I'm going to get some laughter on this one, but um, the um, we're trying to be protective. We're trying to be um, sensitive to the neighbors' concerns, uh, and still be able to build something that's reasonable. And it's, it's a balancing. <coughs> um, and I know we're not going to please everybody. We're not going to please the abutters. We're not going to please the buyer that might be potentially buying the house. So we're trying to do a juggling act to, to, uh, to hit a happy medium. Uh, let me ask you a question, John. You mentioned that it's an economic feasibility issue um, for the whole development that you, that you do all 19 lots. Uh, but the development's grown from 14 to 17 to 19. So are you saying that scaling back now from 19 to 18 affects the entire? The initial development came in from South Portland. I realize you got some added expenses buying up that. Connecting two dead-end streets. Yeah. That road was approximately 700 feet long. They were uh, substantially less development cost doing 700 feet versus this new road, which is almost 2,000 feet in length. Mm. And when you start talking $300 a foot plus, and who knows what it will be if this ever gets approved, plus ledge removal, plus other things, uh, it's very, very costly. So that's the difference. Uh, on seven, 700 feet, uh, if we did a cluster housing subdivision, we'd be looking at probably 17 house lots. Mm -hmm. Now I'm looking at 19 house lots on almost three times the road length. So there's a lot of things that happen since 17 no, lots. I realize that the cost mix has changed because of the necessity of buying the other piece of property and then building road well, access in from it. The, uh, the original subdivision was coming. What I'm asking that. is whether, whether, the, whether taking well, one well, lot out of the mix totally makes the development economically unfeasible. That's all, that's all I'm asking you. Taking one lot and one house out of the mix, does that make the entire development economically unfeasible? The land is approved for 25 units, 25 housing units. We could get that. The plan and the economics show that 19 is a good number to work with. We wanted to go with more. Would 19 or reducing it down to 18 hurt? Absolutely. Absolutely. Would it make it economically unfeasible? Probably. Probably. We were looking to see if we could get more. Well, I'm, I understand the, the name. Cushion. The, the, the again, again, right now, the numbers work. Actually, it's marginal. If costs will continue to rise between now and next spring, 
the, lo the loss of one lot would seriously hurt us, hurt me. Would it throw it, throw us out of the out of the out of the mix? Yes. That was you identified that as a potential low income housing lot. I never use the word low income. Well, I'm, I'm not sure what the proper, what's the word? Moderate is? income. Moderate income. Moderate income in Cape Elizabeth, the maximum sale price of a house would be $225,000. That's the maximum. It could be reduced down, but that's the maximum for moderate income. Well, and I'm worried here. I know I'm treading on ground that we don't normally tread on as a zoning board, but we're treading with a whole issue here that's mm -hmm. new to us. And so I, I, I'm not sure where to go with this, but it just strikes me that having that land in a natural state is some kind of a buffer. It also provides some future emergency egress or entrance <coughs> for, for vehicles in a second situation coming into the neighborhood. Is that not needed? It's not available with this, on this road. It's not available to me. Okay. So I'll pull and shut, shut this road down and put a 25-foot buffer between my land and their land. This is privately owned by the Sawyers and Mrs. Fogg. They say it's not. It was deeded back to the city? OK. It was deeded back to the city with uh, specific Exclusions to Joseph A. Frustacci cannot access his land. I'm either not doing the math right or I'm completely lost on this request. The 75 feet. Tell me where the 75 feet is measured from, from what to what? From the dead end street, Charlotte Street. You have a radius. I think if you have the plan, you'll see there's a radius there. Okay, I see that. 75 foot radius. So that's where you would mark the property. I, I think I might be able to help this happen faster. I, I'm sure that what's confusing you is that there's a 25-foot space between the end of Charlotte Road and the property line. Well, actually, what's confusing me is you're requesting a setback variance of 50 feet. No, of 20, 250 feet. 250 feet. Of 250 feet. It's of 25 feet. Correct. That's what I right. kept thinking. Why aren't they requesting a setback variance of 25 feet? That's Why is it 50 feet? feet? Under the old business, it says, refers to a setback variance of 45 feet, which you said should be 50 feet. So I'm reading that, saying it reads a setback variance of 50 feet. And I'm thinking, why isn't it a setback variance of 25 feet? Yeah, no, that's which is what it should be, right? Correct. OK, thank you. Then I'm not confused. How close is the elbow going to be to the road? The building envelope? Right. 50 feet. It's less than the 45 that you advertised. I guess I get the confusion straightened out, huh? Okay, other questions? Mr. Fustachi, thank you. Um, Mr. Crawford. of the previous matter, I may have to identify those two. Um, one point I wanted to make sure right from the start, I did request uh, the last time that the board make specific findings on each of the matters that it was addressed, and I would uh, re-invoke that request here. Um, the first thing I'm puzzling over, I have a question for the council on that. He's asking for specific findings. Are, are you asking for findings above and beyond what the board went through? Uh, Yes, because the, the board voted on each of the issues, but you didn't state exactly your reasoning and what in the record uh, allowed you to conclude.
include on each of those points coming through. So I'd ask you when you go through that, your list of all the prongs on the variance that you state specifically what points you rely on in connection with your vote. Um, my concern is that the law court has recently indicated that records where it cannot understand the exact reasoning or the findings or the conclusions are remanded back and we have to do a, an extra trip around the horn before we get these things resolved. So that's the basis of my request. Um, I'm struggling first with the, the uh, request that's before you because in the previous request, the issue related to building envelopes, I believe it was collectively decided by the board not to address the issue of the location of building envelopes deferring to the planning board. The request that's before you uh, arises under the exact same section in connection with the 50-foot building envelope that was addressed in the previous request. And what it indicates is that the bounds of a the building envelope shall be at least 75 feet from the right-of-way of any road existing prior to June 4, 1997. <coughs> at least 20 feet from the right-of-way of a road serving a lot, at least 50 feet from any building on, envelope of any adjacent lot. So I'm struggling first from inception on why we're attempting to address this request if, our, if the board's previous reasoning was that we shouldn't be addressing uh, matters related to the location of building envelopes. Um, I'm also, I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Keneally's uh, points there because I think that that is a, an opportunity that uh, certainly my clients would like to see is perhaps it doesn't make sense to compress and relax certain standards and put another structure here. It's one out of 19. My rough calculation is that's five or six percent of the total. Uh, Mr. Frustacci indicates that that's uh, uh, of some significance and importance to him. <clears throat> I'm also wondering if, in fact, that more appropriately we should be here to relax the standard under the building ordinance for purposes of this density issue in connection with this property. We've had some discussion here about the 9,000 uh, lot size, not to go above that particular lot size. Perhaps uh, a better application would be to allow us to go a little bit above the, the lot size and have a little more green space in, in this application. Um, I also wanted to point out uh, some things in regards to the uh, proceedings that I was involved in with the, before the city of South Portland on the discontinuance of Charlotte Street and, and also Edgewood Road down here. The, the issue was brought to a head and the discontinuance was acted on by the city of South Portland. The council voted for the discontinuance with the idea that there would be further discussions. There's no preclusion for future use of that particular area. The city owns that. It's a discontinued roadway. But what they wanted is some accommodations and some controls and some input of the issues that the South Portland residents would face if those roads were used for egress and ingress to an adjacent neighborhood. <clears throat> I won't uh, go into any greater uh, detail on, on our views on this. I think you know that we don't think that this application satisfies the practical difficulty test. And uh, those other points that I raised uh, in the previous proceeding, if I can abbreviate those, um, <clears throat> we don't think there's anything unique about this property that requires this granting of a variance. Um, we think there is still this issue about, under the ordinance, the concept here is that we want to have distances between building envelopes. Your council, and I think you have collectively uh, considered at least whether or not the adjacent building envelopes have any input uh, into your analysis, but we think they do, and we'd ask that you uh, review this accordingly. Um, I think the key thing here that uh, Mr. Keneally's remarks uh, indicate is that uh, there's feasible alternatives available, again, on this particular property, and I think Mr. Frustacci has the burden of proof of showing that, in fact, there is no feasible alternative related to the use of this property. Um, back to the initial test, too, uh, I don't think there's any preclusion of a use here that uh, would otherwise be allowed under the ordinance uh, for this particular zone. So I've cut my uh, remarks short, and I'd certainly be available to the board for any further questions or inquiries that you might have. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Crawford. Um, as a preliminary response to Mr. Crawford's comments, um, I find the most compelling thing that you said um, 
was pointing out that this is no different than a request to establish a building envelope or place a building envelope as opposed to granting a variance. Um, and you're right. And somehow that went right over my head as this was presented. And it seems to me that consistent with what we did before, this is not something for the zoning board to take up. We're not being asked to grant a variance of a side or rear setback at this point. We're being asked to establish the location of a building envelope, which we, well, at least I had stated in the previous matter, that it was my opinion, that, that was not this board's function to do, that that was a planning board function, in which case this argument should be presented to the planning board. Um, the setbacks for lot 12 are established right now at 20 feet uh, front uh, and back and 15 feet on the sides, correct? This is the way that lot sits today. And it's up to the planning board to establish where the building envelope should be placed within those setbacks. Um, and I agree entirely with Mr. Crawford that, um, that what we're being asked to do now is really establish a building envelope position that is no different than the question of establishing a building envelope that was at least 50 feet from another building envelope on an adjacent lot. And I would suggest that this is probably not something that we have any business getting involved in, but Mr. Parkinson, I'd appreciate your input. I, I think what the chairman is suggesting is that a building up of consistent with what you said. I think the chairman suggested before that the building permit of uh, envelope is something that is done uh, by the planning board considering a number of factors such as wetlands and, and so forth, and that in essence it would be premature to um, uh, consider any uh, request for a variance between the distance from a building envelope and a road at this time because the building envelope hasn't been established. I saying what you're suggesting, Mr. Chairman? And that the rear setback for that particular district is 20 feet. Yeah, he's I not think asking so. to be less than yeah. 20 feet. The building uh, envelope hasn't been established. Uh, obviously, your ordinance does say that there has to be 75 feet between a road and a building envelope. But if the building envelope hasn't been created by the planning board, the question isn't properly before you, in so many words. Well, if we're taking the position that we don't establish building envelopes and the location of building envelopes, what we do is grant variances from front, side, or rear setbacks. We're not being asked to do that here. But under the Perkins decision, whether you vary where the building uh, envelope is, um, arguably that is transferred to you. Where well, as I read Perkins, it says that the um, planning board can move the building envelope as long and can move the building envelope up to the established setbacks for this district, which in this case is 20 feet. So that under Perkins, as I read it, the uh, planning board could establish a building envelope at 20 feet from the rear setback line. If, they, if the applicant was asking that the building envelope be set closer than 20 feet, it would have to come to us. That, I, I've said in a letter to the planner, I, I feel it's a reasonable interpretation of the Perkins decision, that, that the planning board still retains that authority, although the ordinance would currently suggests that it can, it can waive the building envelope any way it feels necessary to promote the best possible development. But a, a certain, uh, a reasonable middle ground is exactly what you're saying, is that they can waive the building permit, uh, building envelope up to the setback. So, did we get anywhere with that? Well, I think so. Yeah, but um, it's really not properly. It, it, it's got to go to the planning board and see what the planning board says first. Then the question is procedurally, where do we go from here? Do we entertain a motion to do what with this? To, what do we do with it? To not consider it? No jurisdiction. Um, 
the um, the request, just getting back, back to the basics, is uh, for a waiver of the setback from the building envelope um, from a road. Um, that because the building envelope has not been established yet by the planning board, that the um, request is, is premature to, to this board at this point. Well, we've, we've taken the matter up. Now procedurally, what do I need to do with it? Somebody needs to make a motion to, to that effect that, that the matter isn't properly before the board because the board does not establish the building envelope. This board doesn't establish the building envelope. The planning board does. Okay, it's not presently before us, yes, but, and then what? And we do what with it? Well, is it a matter of- Is it simply, is, is, is it, is it simply a matter of denying it or simply yeah, refusing, request, or refusing to act on it at all? Right, it would be in denial. Deny the request because it's not properly before the board. And they can take it up with the planning board. Well, Lord, I, would you have to go as far as deny or just say it's not yes. properly before? Yes. It's tantamount to a denial. You want to be clear. Denial. You're either approving a variance or. We're not just, denying it on the merits. We're simply denying uh, declining to address the merits. Right. Well, you know, it's not right, as Mr. Right. Crawford suggests. It's, 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 not properly before the board, but it's gotta be a denial. The, the applicant has a right to know, was I, what happened? Was I approved? Was I denied? What, what happened tonight? So, okay, thank you. you. Uh, Mr. Haddow, I'd like your input. I'll give you an opportunity to respond before we go further with a motion. Uh, I think that uh, if the board's inclination is to not decide the merits, then some indication on the record that whatever action the board is taking, it's taking because the issue is not yet ripe for decision before this board would I think be appropriate. Um, I think we could spend all night debating the importance or the uh, interpretation of the Perkins decision and I don't think that would be fruitful. I think that if the board is inclined to move in that direction, and I gather that it is generally inclined to move in that direction, that the proper, again, the, the important thing is simply that the record reflect accurately, I think, the, the board's action, and that, is, that this does not constitute a denial on the merits, but it's rather a denial uh, based on the uh, lack of a, a proper condition precedent, I guess. <clears throat> Procedurally, does the applicant have the opportunity to withdraw the application? Um, I'm going to punt on this, but I think the answer to that is yes, that the applicant always has an opportunity to withdraw it. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've seen numerous instances where a town or a board has permitted the applicant to withdraw when you get in a quagmire like this. Sometimes that's an appropriate. Um, ending to this type of situation. Does he need us to deny this to get to the planning board though? I don't think so. No, I don't think that that our action on it is a That's precondition. Not, yeah, do we have to act on it though? No. Um, I would say no, that we don't need to. Uh, but I'm gonna let Mr. Fristashi's counsel make that call as to how he wants to go forward procedurally with a withdrawal or whether he would like us to procedurally uh, deny it, with the understanding that we won't be denying it on its, on its merits, but rather on the basis of um, what we consider to be a procedural irregularity. I understand, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm just wondering, this may be out of line, but I'm wondering if we could perhaps have five minutes to think about that question. I really hadn't considered it at all before this moment, and I Frankly, I'm not certain what the implications are either way, and I'd like to just take a few minutes to think about it. We will give you that, Thank Mr. You. Mr. Chair. Uh, five minutes. Thank you. I have a question first. That I um, a question first from Dr. Chapman before we take our five minutes. Uh, Mr. Parkinson, uh, in, in view of your earlier comments where it was your feeling that this board should not be intimately concerned with ordinances of an adjacent city, town, in this case, South Portland, in view of building envelope setbacks and respecting that, can we apply your same 
insight that this board should not be uh, intimately concerned with with the setback in regard to a road. Um, again, it's a, it's a good question and it's something I've, I've thought about, and I think that that's a. Um, it's certainly an, an, an analogous situation to um, an ordinance, although it is different in the sense that an ordinance, as I think somebody indicated, is something that's a product of a lot of work, a comprehensive plan, involves uh, um, an effort that um, is in one town that could be quite different than another town, whereas uh, something like a road, uh, the existence of a road is, is a, a more of a tangible thing. Of course, the exact legal status of this road is a bit unclear, uh, at least it is to me. You've been with us a long time, and perhaps that could be cleared up. But um, what, is, you know, the, what is the exact status? Is it discontinued? What rights have been retained? I was flipping through the ordinance trying to determine if, in fact, it still is a road. Do you define a road as a, 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 a private right of way? You, you, you appear to do that. Um, I don't think it's as murky as attempting to deal with a, another town's ordinance, but it's certainly somewhat murky. It's closer on the scale to, say, a setback from another building that might be um, in another town, a little easier to deal with like that, um, but it, it, it's somewhat, somewhat murky. Um, in, in your decision making, you don't necessarily have to go into every possible reason why you decline to um, exercise your jurisdiction um, or every possible reason why uh, the application is denied. And I think what you need to do is, is decide what, what the strongest points are and go, go with those. You don't have to necessarily address every possible one, but certainly you've hit on something that, that is a, a gray area, no doubt. I have a question for you. Um, in the beginning of the section, 1972, yeah. A2, it says in residence of C district, provision of the section shall be optional. Is that pertaining to just the section or is this pertaining to the, the larger section, the subsection two? I, I think it means the, the whole uh, the whole section that, that, that these dimensional standards in uh, 1972, the whole open space zoning is optional. Am I answering your question? You are. So my question is, is how strictly is this construed? It's not too often that you see a statute that they say that by the way, this is optional. Um, what I interpret this to be, and you, you folks have uh, lived this and are obviously much more familiar with how your ordinance was drafted, was an effort uh, to give um, a lot of planning tools to, to the planning board. In other words, uh, here are some tools that you can use, but you don't have to use them. And, and, and the, the, the key, um, phraseology is there a housing and environmental design in, in accordance with the standards um, in a, to, to permit innovative approaches to housing. And so it's an effort to say you can use these tools, you don't have to use them. And, um, but their tools more appropriate for the, for the planning board, not the Right, they, until the Perkins decision came along and some of these things started coming, coming your way. And, and that's where we're doing this line drawing as to how much is, is in, in your jurisdiction now and how much is it? Clearly, if it weren't for the Perkins decision, this all would be back at the planning board and, and it would be intended to, the, the applicant would dialogue with the planning board to come up with the best possible development. I can see that this was probably the result of a lot of sessions at a comprehensive plan committee uh, where they talked about we need more flexibility and that sometimes a town can get tied down by its own regulations and come up with some unusual results because the regulations compel you to do it. I think this was an effort to give you some flexibility. So can that, will that section permit us then to grant a variance based on that, a variance from the building envelope requirement? Well, that gets back to what the chairman yeah, was talking about, that is, that, is that we're not really in the um, building envelope business, business and, right. and that uh, you, know, you, you, you get the planning board to to establish that, and then maybe somebody can come back for a second look with you folks. Um, really what you need to do is focus on what's in front of you, and, and maybe these issues about what's happened as a result of Perkins could be addressed in a 
workshop format where we can attempt to go back and fine tune the ordinance to, to address that. Um, We're in recess for five minutes.